Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 261, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mr. Robert Woodhead, formerly of Surtech and one of the creators of the Wizardry franchise. In this installment, we get into uh, the development of that first Wizardry game, the uh, conflicts that he had with Andrew Greenberg, his uh, Wizardry co-creator, and much, much more. I think you're really going to get a kick out of this. Also, uh, uh, Robert reflects on the state of modern games and how things have changed since those days of uh, wizardry back in the early 80s. Anyway, we got a lot of great stuff to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Woodhead. All right, so you mentioned that you didn't really get along with Andrew you know, when you first uh, first encountered, I guess this was at Cornell, right, where you guys you guys met, so? Yep. Well, why not? It seemed like you'd be both in playing all these games on Play-Doh. <laughs> well, I wanted to play the games, but, his, no. but these terminals were for... Um, educational use hmm. uh, and so um, and w apparently if I recall correctly and one of Andy's jobs was to make sure that that they got used for that and not for frivolous things oh. so so we had a conflict so you tell them they had all these games on the system and they you weren't supposed to play them uh, in fact they had a program that would that was called the enforcer that would if it noticed you were playing one of the games <laughs> except during like the middle of the night, it would kick you off. Oh, geez. Well, well something must have changed with him, right? What, how did you guys end up doing uh, uh, Wizardry? I guess it was, what, Dungeons of Despair or something like that back then, right? Uh, I was always called Wizardry, but uh, Dungeons of Despair was just the name for a particular scenario we wrote. Um, what actually happened was... Um, I had been kicked out of Cornell with one semester to go because my grades were too low, um, because I was fooling around on computers too much. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I, I was back home. I was doing um, some programming um, for what became Surtech. Um, and at one point, I got the idea of, well, you know, maybe I can do a dungeon game for the Apple II. Um, and so I actually started writing a game called Paladin. Um, and I don't remember the exact details, but somehow Andy and I got in touch with each other. And it turned out that he was also writing a game um, called Wizardry. Um, and my uh, game was uh, written in Pascal, and his game was written in Apple Basic. Um, and so we decided that, that we would sort of join forces, and um, we... Uh, I went down to Cornell um, and visited with him for like a long weekend, and we kind of pounded out a um, sort of a merging of the two games of, of some of the ideas he had, some of the ideas that I had. Um, we figured out pretty quickly that Pascal was the better route to go, but um, there were some aspects of the way I wanted to do things that, that uh, he had better ideas on. Uh, so we ended up developing um, sort of the, the map for the game, the data structures. Um, and um, then I went off and I wrote a set of database editors that would let him construct the stories, the, the scenarios. And then while he was doing that, I went off and wrote the game that would then read those databases and, and um, play the game. Um, and then after that happened, uh, we did a huge amount of play testing, mostly by him and um, a group of his friends, many of whom are immortalized inside the game as monsters or <laughs> um, in other ways. Um, uh, I take it by this point, he'd gotten over his strictness <laughs> with the well i mean you know it, it was a different environment because mm. at this uh, at this point 
you know, we weren't in conflict. So, um, and, and, you know, we're still friends to this day. I mean, uh, you know, in fact, I, I just, he just Facebooked me the other day. Uh, you know, he's lost some weight, so he's real happy, which is, which is good. We used to have a joke that the, the, the total weight of wizardry authors is a conserved quantity because uh, every time I'd lose weight, he'd gain it and the other way around. But apparently we, we've disproved this law. Well, so how did this collaboration between you two, would you say it was 50-50 or 60-40 or what? Um, I don't really look at it in terms of percentages. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the game would have been uh, nearly as good um, if it had just been me or just been him. I think we complemented each other very well. You know, basically, any time that we both thought something was a good idea, it probably was. And, um, and any time we were in violent disagreement, uh, they, usually the, there was something wrong with both of our arguments. So uh, in, in general, I, I, I think we kind of, it allowed us to kind of you know, cut away um, most of the inessential stuff. And you know, I was good at banging out code, and, and he, was, he had a better touch for the story, and, the, and, and especially the balancing of the monsters. Do you remember any issues that you had that you wanted to do things one way and he wanted to do it the other? Oh my goodness, it's just like what, thirty-five <laughs> years now? Just thirty-five years ago. <laughs> no, not not really. I mean, um, so it wasn't like he wanted real-time combat; you wanted turn-based combat or anything that. Well, those sort of things were were driven by the technological limitations that we were dealing with. Well, speaking of those uh, limitations, so it, is this true? I was reading about the, uh, well, this is on Wikipedia, so maybe you can ver verify it. But according to them, it took two and a half years to develop the game. I'm not sure where they get that figure from. Let's uh, see, they talked about how it was in BASIC and Pascal. Well, here's something that I was wondering about. So I've read that the Apple, the original Apple II was not, didn't have enough memory to run the game, right? And you had to have a, either a 48K expansion or the you had to wait for the Apple II Plus, I believe, which had enough RAM. Or, is there any truth to that? Or, or what? Um, well, the development of Wizardry from the time Andy and I started working together, I think was about 15, 16 months. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit longer. And we had something that was, you know, demonstrable within about six months. Um, the, 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 the resource limitation we were dealing with was that um, to run Apple Pascal, uh, at least the full development environment, you needed um, 64K. And the maximum amount of memory a typical Apple could be fitted with right on the motherboard was 48K. So there was a special memory card um, you could get that would give you the extra 16K. And actually, the way it worked was kind of hairy. It, it, it had sort of different banks of memory that you had to turn on and off. So you couldn't access all the memory on, on the memory card at the same time. Um, uh, what we were promised by Apple um, was that they would come out with a, a, a 48K runtime version of Apple Pascal so that you could distribute Apple Pascal programs um, to, uh, to people without them having to buy a copy of Apple Pascal and having to buy this extra 16K card. Um, and so... Wizardry could not be released until that runtime was available. Uh, and I, I don't remember if it really got delayed very much, but I seem, to, I seem to recall that it did get delayed a little bit, but that actually turned out to be a good thing because it gave us more time for testing. Um, and uh, so, so Wizardry, getting it to run in that 48K was, uh, was a significant challenge. Um, 
but it turned out to to be um, very handy because then uh, as more people got the extra 16k card um, and in particular when we moved to the Commodore 64 which had the extra 16k um, we uh, we were able to do things like use that extra 16k as a as a as a disk cache, uh, which radically reduced the amount of diskware. Because <laughs> when Wizardry was was running a combat, it was swapping in code and data like crazy. It was the only way to get it to work, uh, and having having a, a RAM cache for the disk uh, really made things run about 50 times faster. <laughs> We've talked about how you were playing these Play-Doh uh, role-playing games, but I'm wondering, were you also influenced, or had you played the uh, tabletop pen and paper versions of Dungeons & Dragons? Oh, sure. Played that when I was in college. Were you the Dungeon Master? I, no, no. I, I, I tried it, but, uh, you know, I wasn't that good at it. But, yeah, I had the original <laughs> little, little box with the original rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a couple questions in about... Uh, wizardry, uh, the first one. Uh, one thing I always liked about it was that you create that whole party of adventurers. You know, a lot of the other games, especially modern ones, you just have the single character and you know you have the NPCs and all. I was just kind of wondering, what is your, what are your thoughts on this? How did you imagine this? I mean, was the thought all along that one person would control all the characters, or uh, were you thinking more of trying to replicate that tabletop uh, Dungeons and Dragons experience with a group of your friends playing? I think it was a bit of both, actually. Um, you know, since I had grown up playing D and D, you know, you don't play D and D by yourself. You play it with people. You have a party. So that seemed that would just to be a very natural concept for this kind of a role playing game, uh, and um, it just uh, turned out, you know. You know, six uh, you know six characters. That means you have a front three and a back three. Uh, and, you know, it just was you know very relatively easy to do, um, and and we had you know we could do it, so we did it. You think that kind of game would hold up today, where you had to create so many characters from the, at the beginning? no idea but i know that uh, back in the old days gamers were real gamers and and they <laughs> and they they weren't pussies like they are the kids are today so oh, i salute you uh, speaking of that i was uh, i really one of the things i remember about wizardry is making making your own map you know you got right. some graph paper out and you did this and you know even in the manual uh, it says a uh, mapping is one of the most important skills that uh successful wizardry players possess. You know, of course, now we've got all these auto maps and everything. Um, you think something's been lost, you know, with all the auto mapping tools, you actually preferred the, you think there was something, like that was part of the fun, right? Was making your own maps, it wasn't just a, this hindrance or technological necessity? Well, it definitely was a technological necessity. <laughs> I mean, you know, we didn't have room to do an automatic mapping feature. Um, uh, but that said, again, you know, when you're when you're playing with your buddies on a, a tabletop, you know the, the the GM doesn't give you a map. You have to draw it out. So, I mean, you know, we wanted to to recreate the and 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 get the same sort of feeling that you would when you were playing with your friends, even if you were playing by yourself. And and that's one of the aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there's definitely been. A massive shift in the, I don't know, skill set or background of, of gamers, uh, you know, since the days of Wizardry. It just seems like, you know, people aren't willing to, you know, to think that much. You know, they just want something they can pick up and start playing without a lot of thought and reading a manual or <laughs> preparation of any kind. Have you noticed a, a trend like that? Um, I, I don't really think that's uh, what's the right way to say this um, 
I don't consider that to be a serious issue. I mean, people who um, play games uh, for enjoyment should just be able to play them, and people who want to optimize and be like super cool uh, and you know be like the absolute best um, will take the time to to learn the fine details. I was kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, I think this would be a good spot to put this in about uh, Wizardry 4, uh, Return of Wordna. You know, I, I had Robert Sirotek on not too long ago, and we were talking about this game, and he said that there was kind of some, I don't know if, I don't know how heated it was, but there was some argument about, you know, should we make this? It's too difficult, and it's going to turn away, you know, some gamers. It's just too hard. Uh, and you, sounds like the other side of that was, well, you know, the, we want to put the, we want to have a bigger challenge. We want to, you know, just do this. You know, looking back on it, you know, how do you how do you see this in, in hindsight? Do you think you were right to make the game hard? Or, <laughs> do you even think the game was really all that hard? Oh, the game was definitely hard. The, the, the question is, was it fair? <laughs> um, yeah. And I, we spent a lot of time trying to ensure that it was incredibly difficult, but also complete as much as possible, as fair as possible. Um, you know, it went hugely behind schedule. I mean, it literally for a year, there was, I, I went a whole year absolutely convinced I would be finished with this game. You know, it'll be ready next week. I kept telling people it'll be ready next week. And I did that for an entire year and I was being absolutely honest. Uh, that that's how hard that game was to write, let alone to play. Um, in hindsight, uh, Robert is probably right from the commercial standpoint. Um, and I think we were right to do it the way we did it from the, from an artistic standpoint. And, you know, I, by that time, you know, I, I, this was the fourth game um, I was much more interested in doing something new and interesting as opposed to just more of the same with a couple of extra bells and whistles. Yeah, it seems to me there's always this choice of whether you want to cater to your core audience, you know, the really hardcore wizardry fans at that point, of course, and it's always that other idea, well, we're, if we do that, we're going to miss out on this, you know, all these... Uh, I call them the mythical Joe gamers out there <laughs> that these you know publishers always seem to think are, are you should be catering to instead of the the core. You know, and I've seen I was thinking too about the later Ultima games and also I think some of the later King's Quest where they really started making some efforts to appeal to that broader demographic and it didn't really go over that well. It's all there there are always, you know, trade offs. I mean Game, games, movies, whatever, it's, there's always this tension between commercial realities and artistic, you know, desires. And, you know, sometimes you just hit everything perfectly uh, and, you know, it's a great selling product and you're really pleased with it artistically. And... Um, Sometimes, you know, one side it turns out to be like uh, you, you, the, the product is tilted one side or the other. It's a huge commercial success, but you look at it and you say, boy, I wish I'd done this differently. Uh, and there's other times where you look at it and say, well, I really like what I did. And, you know, if, if, if the market doesn't like it, well, then screw them. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week with a third installment. A lot of great stuff to cover, including, of course, the other wizardry games and much, much more. So stay tuned. Lots of good stuff coming up from Mr. Woodhead. As always, I want to thank you very, very much for your support of this show. Uh, it's uh, really great for you guys uh, uh, to support the show. You can do that in many different ways. Uh, you can support it financially. I'll just go to the Patreon link in the show notes. And the cool thing about that is any amount is fine. Uh, whatever you think the show is worth, 
a dollar, five dollars, whatever you can afford, whatever you're comfortable with, guys. I really appreciate that. Uh, also, if you, uh, whether or not you want to support the show uh, financially, you can help me spread the word about the show. Uh, that doesn't cost anything to do. I uh, just post a couple of links uh, to your friends on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, I, you know, have been talking about a gold box uh, special that I wanted to make when I hit twenty-five thousand, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, last week I only had 29 new subscribers, so yeah, that's looking like that's probably going to be on <laughs> hold for quite a while. Uh, you know, if you guys have uh, ideas for me about how I might uh, get the word out a little faster, <laughs> you know, so I can, I can start work on that thing, uh, let me know. But uh, yeah, about you know, 30 new subscribers uh, a week is going to take a while to get to 25,000. So uh, let me know what your thoughts are on that. All right, what about the news from the Matt Cave? Oh, lots of news this week. First of all, the Wings uh, Remastered Edition is out. I just downloaded it a few minutes ago. Haven't got a chance to play it yet, but uh, for everybody who backed out on Kickstarter, you should definitely check your email and uh, get that downloaded. Uh, I haven't had a chance to, you know, to even have it installed yet, so if you have uh, been playing it, let me know what you think. Uh, also, there's a bunch of new Kickstarter news. Uh, there's one called the Black Glove. Uh, this is made by the Bioshock Infinity guys, Bioshock Infinite, uh, rather. Um, they're trying to raise, uh, I think, about a half a million. I didn't write down the amount here. It's got 27 days left to go. Uh, but anyway, I was looking, I watched the video. I was really intrigued. It looks like they're trying to do some pretty interesting things with that engine. So, so go check that out. looks pretty cool. Um, then we have one called The Flame in the Flood. This is, uh, quote, unquote, a roguelike river journey. <laughs> Seems like they're trying to sort of mash up the old uh, Oregon Trail style games with roguelikes. Kind of reminded me, too, of the uh, Don't Starve games. You remember that? Anyway, it looks pretty cool, very artistically done. Uh, I don't really know what to think about it, actually, but... Uh, pass that along. I went ahead and backed it. It definitely looks interesting enough. Uh, I'm curious to see what they turn out at the end, but about a month left on that. Uh, then we have the case of Charles Dexter Ward. I mentioned this last time. This is, of course, uh, Augustin, Augustine or Augustine Cordes. Uh, now, that was uh, this is based on H.P. Lovecraft. Of course, this is the guy that did Scratches and he ends as well as uh, uh, Asylum Kickstarter. He's uh, trying to raise 250000 already raised 54 k uh, 19 days left to go. Uh, not, uh, you know, I guess that could go either way at this point. But if you like horror adventure games, I highly recommend that you go check out this Kickstarter and uh, hopefully pledge to it. Uh, also, the Grey Walker's Purgatory. I remember this is the turn-based uh, post-apocalyptic game. Uh, it seems to be uh, riding the uh, Wasteland 2 wave. Uh, they're trying to raise 40k, uh, a little over halfway there now with 23 days left to go. Uh, so again, if you play Wasteland 2, uh, looking for more, uh, go check that out. I think you might uh, like what you see there. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for the Kickstarter news. Also, there's a some Gabriel Knight news, uh, one of my favorite uh, adventure game series. I thought I had it over there. Maybe Oh, there's uh, Gabriel Knight 3. Uh, but Gabriel Knight, Sins of the Father, uh, this is the first one. Has uh, been remade, 25th, or I'm sorry, 20th anniversary edition. You can get that. Uh, pre, you can pre-order it now uh, for only $17. I think it's three days left, as I'm, uh, as I <laughs> wrote this down anyway. Uh, so go check that out. It's a classic uh, point-and-click adventure game. It's really cool. I think you'll like it if you like adventure games. And then finally, uh, wow, this is like the longest Matt Chat news segment ever. Uh, my good friend Adam, uh, the co-host, or one of the rats uh, from Rat Chat, uh, has posted a, an interview, a pretty lengthy interview with Paul Newrath on his uh, Fragments of Silicon blog. Uh, you probably know the name, but just in case, this is the, one of the Looking Glass uh, folks uh, responsible for so many uh, great games. I uh, wish I could think one. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, they're the guys that did the uh, System Shock games, and they also did the Ultima Underworld series. All right, so uh, what about that ale of the week? Ah, well, worked up quite a thirst after that news news hour. Uh, this is the Surly Brewing Company Fest Lager. Surly Fest. Uh, beer for Stein from a can. Let's see. Traditional Oktoberfest beer from Surly uh, 9. 
I guess you're trying to do some German there. If you want one of these, grab your passport and head over to Munch and bring us back some pretzels. Our fest-inspired beer is brewed with imported malted barley, rye, and a German lager yeast strain. We hop this beer with a single variety and then we dry hop it. A single hop, dry hopped, rye lager beer. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody was having some fun with the, the can. Ah, fresh beer, keep it cult. Wow. Looking on the uh, can here, I don't see anything about the alcohol content. So I have no idea really uh, <laughs> what to expect. Uh, anyway, let's see. Yeah, nothing. Uh, this is brewed in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. It's not too far from here. This is actually pretty popular. A lot of the uh, local places are stocking it and supporting there. Uh, microbrewery, which is pretty cool. I like to do what I can too. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I'm sitting here with the Surly Fest. <sighs> smells pretty good. You definitely smell the hops. And you know, I was also thinking, I can't believe I forgot to mention this earlier since I was just talking about Gabriel Knight, <laughs> 20th anniversary edition. But uh, we're actually going to have Jane Jensen on the Rat Chat. Remember, this is the special Patreon-only chats. Uh, you can only get access to those through the Patreon site. Now, it doesn't matter if you, you, know, if you uh, pledge a dollar, uh, per episode, five dollars, you know, whatever amount uh, you can get access to those. It's going to be pretty cool. Now the rat chats, uh, we don't bring uh, people in to chat uh, with those, but you can ask questions, and there is a text chat uh, you can use to participate uh, on. So I'm really looking forward to that. Hopefully, some of you guys will make it. Uh, but a recording will be be available later, uh, so you can watch it then if you happen to miss the uh, live recording. So anyway, so I'm waiting for this fest ale to. Uh, the head is really. Th Thick on this, uh, you know, it's taking a long time to, <laughs> I think it's just kind of stuck there. So I guess I'll just try to work around it. You know, some guy was asking me if the uh, the fact that this is basically part of a dead animal, if that affects the taste of the ale. And I would like to think that it does, you know, in a <laughs> very good way. Anyway, let's give this a taste. I guess I should have. Uh... <sighs> Not, not a really strong aroma on this. You can smell some hops, a little bit of that uh, fused wiring-like uh, smell you get sometimes with these really sort of bitter hops. Anyway, let's give it a taste. What's kind of a flat taste on this? I was really expecting something with a lot more uh, flavor to it. Uh, let me try it again. It's very watery, uh, not really detecting much in the way of flavor. Now, the alcohol content, uh, unless they've really done a good job disguising, it must be pretty low. I'm thinking something like 4.7, maybe uh, 5%, somewhere around in there. It's not a very, uh, you know, inspired selection. You think with the Fest Ale and trying to represent themselves for Oktoberfest, they would have uh, produced something with a bit more punch to it. I'll try it again. It just kind of, just kind of thin on the flavor. Um, you know what can I say? Not really impressed with this. I taste a little bit of the hops, uh, but mostly just sort of tastes like water. So I'm gonna go a one out of five drinking horns on this. A big disappointment from these guys. Uh, they've done some pretty outstanding uh, brews in the past that I've had on the show. I like their uh, uh, what's uh, what's the one they've got? Overrated ale. <laughs> Actually, is a Quite nice, uh, despite the name. But anyway, one out of five drinking horns on this. You know, I think I'd probably just say pass on the uh, Surly Fest Ale. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I found a quotation. I was looking for quotations about challenges, uh, given this interview material. I found one from George S. Patton that I thought was uh, pretty good. thought I'd share this with you. All right, here we go. Accept the challenges so that you can feel the exhilaration of victory. See you guys next week. I like the simple ones, the GM. Reliable, like that guy. Yes, but Max, he's so old-fashioned. You don't see too many on the shelf, do you? Well, the only reason he's on the shelf is because a trash bin fell on his foot. That's what I'm saying. They're very complicated. They shouldn't be made that complicated. It's the state of the art right now. Too complicated. We don't need that kind of complication. It's a complicated world, Matt. Oh, please. You want